In the almost two years since journalist James Foley first went missing, we made regular check-ins with the man leading the search, Phil Balboni of Global Post. He never lost hope that Jim would be found safe. Sadly, it was not to be. This week, almost a month after Jim Foley's death, we reached out to Phil Balboni again. In a frank and at times emotional interview, we learned new details about the effort to bring Jim home. Global Post chief Phil Balboni already had experience dealing with terrorists. Reporter Jim Foley survived his first kidnapping back in 2011 while covering the conflict in Libya. So when it happened again in the fall of 2012, this time in Syria, Balboni knew what to do. I immediately picked up my BlackBerry and called uh, the man who's the head of the kidnap and ransom department for uh, Kroll International. And uh, we talked about the case, and I hired him to help. And that began uh, an intensive, um, truly international, incredibly expensive um, and demanding effort to find Jim Foley and to bring him out. They had no idea where Jim was or who his captors were. There was some evidence he was being held by the Assad regime, but almost a year went by without a word or clue to his whereabouts, or even if he was still alive. Then suddenly, a lead. Finding out where he was, was like so often in life, was luck. Um, there was this young Belgian uh, jihadist who had returned from jihad, had gone back to his home in Antwerp, uh, through the efforts of his father, who was a very brave, uh, you know, gutsy guy who went inside Syria to bring his son out. And um, it turns out that this young man had spent quite a bit of time, a couple of months with Jim, in detention, uh, and was able to give us the first detailed account of, uh, of, of Jim, that we knew that he was in good health, uh, in good spirits. So that was um, uh, our first indication. And then it wasn't long after that that the first email arrived from the kidnappers. And what did that email say? It didn't say much. It came to, came to me and, came to, to you. and Michael Foley, Jim's brother. And it just said, you know, we're holding, um, uh, you know, your colleague, uh, or, you know, uh, Jim Foley. And, um, you know, um, we want, you know, a lot of money. And uh, that was about the gist of the message. Were you sure it was real? Well, we weren't because we had encountered many hoaxes along the way. But this had the feel of legitimacy. It had an untraceable email address. Um, so we talked. Um, our security team, FBI, the family, and a response was crafted to that email. They came up with a series of proof-of-life questions, things only Jim Foley would know. They were obscure. I mean, they were non-searchable on the, on the Internet. Maybe it took seven or eight days to, for them to respond, but they all came back absolutely, completely correct. And that was a milestone moment when we knew that um, we were dealing with the people who had Jim. His captors, it turned out, were members of the Islamic State. A few emails followed, including one demanding a ransom of 100 million euros or the release of Muslim prisoners. Then, silence. It wasn't until the Islamic State started to ransom European hostages that they learned more about what was happening to Jim. He was, you know, regularly physically abused and tortured, um, and even perhaps singled out uh, by his captors. Um, but we also learned of his incredible courage and how he was really uh, an inspiration to the other hostages. I mean, his spirits were never broken. As a news guy, how did you decide what to make public? Well, how did you weigh the benefits of making it more public, more outrage, maybe more money, maybe right. more, versus wondering if making it public might harm him. At the beginning, in, after Thanksgiving 2012, uh, we m 
we made a decision we we're going to keep this quiet but we talked about whether that was the wise thing to do and we came to a decision that would be uh, Global Post, the Foley's, our security people, that we would go public with Jim's kidnapping. We're committed to do everything within our ability to secure a safe release, and this is our only priority. But while they went public, they kept some details secret, like the fact that Foley had a traveling companion who was also captured. The family of British journalist John Cantley did not want his kidnapping made public. But yesterday, the Islamic State released this video. My name is John Cantley. I am a British journalist who used to work for some of the bigger newspapers and magazines in the UK, including the Sunday Times, the Sun, and the Sunday Telegraph. It's not an execution video, thank the Lord. It's a propaganda video. It's quite quite remarkable, and he has promised that more will be coming. In the video, Cantley talks about the U.S. and British policy of not paying ransom, and how his fellow European captives were released after money changed hands. They negotiated with the Islamic State and got their people home, while the British and Americans were left behind. It's very alarming to see where this is all headed, and it looks like history repeating itself yet again. Would money have made a difference? I mean, if you would have been, if, if, if the government sort of condoned you trading, you know, raising the money and, you know, just look the other way because they don't do it, right. would that have made a difference? Oh, yes, I think so. I mean, um, you know, the policy of not paying a ransom, I think, is, is sound in many respects. It was global post policy as well. Um, the family... Uh, John and Diane and, and, and their children made a decision that they wanted to pay a ransom and they were hard at work raising the money to pay a ransom. I think it's hard to believe that if there had been capability at the appropriate moment that it would not have been successful. I mean. I don't really like to go there, mm. and um, I don't think there's any particular purpose for me or, or you know, obviously not for Jim to, uh, to revisit what might have been, because we can't take it back. Did the State Department, Pentagon, let you know that there was a rescue attempt that was going to be made? Did no. you know in advance? Never. Never. The, we obviously knew and talked about that one option, given there was a no ransom policy, was some sort of a, of a rescue mission. Um, we thought it would be extremely risky with uh, a high probability of uh, the hostages being killed. On the 4th of July, a rescue mission by U.S. Special Forces failed. They had the wrong location. And I still don't understand, and I don't know if we ever will, why um, <clears throat> the location was the wrong one. Then last month came the final communication. The kidnappers said they would execute Jim in retaliation for recent bombings in Iraq. It was a terrible email to get. But I still believe that um, it, was, it was a good chance it was a bluff, that they kept these... Uh, Jim and the others alive uh, for all this period of time and that they were more valuable alive than dead. Balboni and the Foley's discussed making the threat public but decided against it. And then, you know, everything went to hell. On August 19th, ISIS released the infamous beheading video confirming the death of James Wright Foley. He was 40 years old. An American journalist has been beheaded by ISIS terrorists. Execution of an American journalist by this terrorist group called ISIS. Today the entire world is appalled by the brutal murder of Jim Foley by the terrorist group ISIL. Jim was a journalist, a son, a brother, and a friend. Jim was taken from us in an act of violence that shocks the conscience of the entire world. I. You know, I, I never in a million years imagined on that Saturday morning in November that 
it would end this way. Um, you know, it's still hard to talk about. Here now for more reflection on the James Foley case are Adam Riley and Callie Crossley, both of WGBH News and Dan Kennedy of Northeastern University. Of course, I spoke to Phil about the statements made by Diane Foley last week. Diane was very outspoken that she felt the United States government really failed her son and didn't do enough. Phil really didn't want to discuss that. He didn't want to react to Diane Foley, but he had uh, he has a different perspective. I think it's fair to say that um, he is not that critical, but he, he didn't really, out of respect for the family's feelings, didn't really want to address it. I was particularly um, just riveted to this because there was so much, so much detail that we didn't know. And I, I know Phil, I've worked with him for many years, he was my boss at Channel 5, that as a news person, you want the truth to come out. You want everyone to know what you're doing, what kind of communications you've had. So for him to keep all that in, the communications with the terrorists, the fact that John Cantley was, was also a captive, that they knew that these two friends who had been traveling together were in this together, but they couldn't say. It's, it's a lot to hold in, and it went almost two years. It, it, it was an incredible interview. I mean, we were just sitting here on the set watching it and just riveted, and you just see the, the caring and the emotion that, that Phil brought to the table and in talking about what happened. Um, you know, it's interesting that he says that Global Post also believes in, in not paying mm -hmm. ransom. I think if I were Jim Foley's father or brother, I would wish that the government would pay a ransom. I, I guess if you look at it more broadly, it kind of seems like the real problem is that European countries are paying ransoms. If, if everybody would refuse to pay a ransom, it could be that people like Jim Foley would still be alive today, but, but there's really no way of knowing. Yeah, and I, I don't fault either the U.S. government no. or Global Post at all for not wanting to pay a ransom, although as you say, if I were Jim Foley's father or mother, I would have wanted everything done to save him, and I want to be able to do everything that I could to save him. But that being said, I mean, if you pay a ransom for any journalist, it then makes it more likely that other journalists working in the same place are going to be abducted and that a higher ransom will be charged. It ups the danger level for the group. So I, I think it's a sound policy, but uh, I, I certainly understand why it would be difficult for James Foley's parents to accept that. I'm just struck by some of the practical, practical information. First of all, this presumes that anybody could raise a ransom. I mean, they backed off of the original outrageous sum, but it was going to be a lot of money. I, I don't even know where you get that. I mean, if the government is not going to kick in, where, where do you raise it? Maybe you can, I don't know. So that's the first thing. The second thing I was impressed by, and this does not happen for a lot of journalists, and remember most of the people working for Global Post are freelance, they're mm -hmm. independent, that they would take up their own money, that organization, based on not having a staff relationship with Jim Foley, really, and you know, hire folks to try to trace where he is and figure that out. I mean, that's a lot of money, too, let me, let me just say. more than a million dollars and actually yeah. ended up putting Jim Foley on staff, thinking that maybe by having an association with a news organization, that would somehow get through to these guys that he was part of a, a bigger organization. I, I just want to say oh, yeah, one other ahead. thing that hmm. Phil did tell me, and he's, he used the phrase in the New York Times, too. He, he wanted to make it clear that his security team, which was much broader than just Phil, included Diane and Michael Foley, the son and the brother of Jim Rather, and FBI agents and this Kroll agency, he said, but in terms of the government aid, he said, he said, Emily, we were the laboring or we were the organization, we were the team that really labored this as opposed to the State Department or anyone. That's like interesting, that. especially in light of the fact that, um, as, as I think Dan said, or maybe it was you, Emily, he was circumspect when it came to criticizing mm -hmm. yeah. what had been done or had not been done. But one place where I really heard criticism come through clearly was the attempt to rescue Foley oh, yeah. in the wrong place. By the way, he told me more about that because he said every hostage even though they said they had been moved, every single hostage who they debriefed after the fact had been held at the same place. So the fact that they went to the wrong place, he just could not understand. That, that, that virtually every single person was some kind of a children's hospital outside of Aleppo.
Hmm. Did you get any indication that they're thinking about changing the way they, they sort they're, of structure themselves thinking, in terms of yep, freelancers versus that, staff employees? Yep, and they're thinking about all that, because that's what they do. They're global post, and they cover international hotspots, so they're right. rethinking everything.